Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to this first uh, IP Espresso podcast um, from the Southeast Asia Intellectual Property Help Desk, um, which is a service for European SMEs. Um, do grab yourself a coffee for today's session, uh, as I have done here. Um, we're going to take a quick look at how to protect your company's intellectual property in the Southeast Asia market. Um, for those of you who don't know about us, um, the Southeast Asia IP SME Help Desk is funded by the European Commission, uh, and it's there to provide information and first-line support for small and medium-sized enterprises um, to help them to protect and exploit their intellectual property when they are active in the Southeast region. Um, these services are free uh, and confidential uh, and open to all SMEs based in the European Union. Um, they are also available to uh, companies in Norway, Iceland, and Liechtenstein. Um, so our team of experts who are based in Vietnam um, can answer any questions you may have about IP in this region. Um, and our website also has a wide range of fact sheets and case studies uh, that I do encourage you to go and have a look at. Uh, and all of this can be found on our website, which is www.sea-iphelpdesk. Dot EU, and I'll share that again at the uh, at the end of the show. So, as I said, this is the first in our regular series of podcasts, uh, one episode every two months, uh, and this will dive into different aspects of intellectual property in Southeast Asia. So, do follow our social media channels, um, where we'll be keeping you updated on the next editions. Um, we are delighted that this first episode is being produced in collaboration with the Four IP Council, uh, which is a European Research Council which is dedicated to developing high quality academic insight and empirical evidence uh, on topics that are always related to patents, intellectual property uh, and innovation. Um, as this is the first episode, we're gonna take a more general view today um, at the different ways of protecting your innovations in the region. Um, also, we are recording today's session. So don't worry if you have to drop out, you'll be able to find all of this uh, on our uh, YouTube channel. Um, Finally, just a, a final word also about World IP Day, which is the 26th of April, which is next week. Um, so today we'll also touch upon uh, women and IP, which is the theme of this year's World Intellectual Property Day. Um, we are therefore delighted to have two leading female IP experts with us today um, who will share some of their personal experiences in this sector and also discuss why it's important to focus on intellectual property um, and also to consider the great challenges of accessing the knowledge and skills and resources that are uh, that are needed here. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce our two guests. Joining us today, we have uh, Gitanjali Sharma, who's joining us from Mumbai, uh, and who is a uh, IP lawyer, uh, and also Wei Ying Chang, who's joining us from Singapore, uh, and she is a also an IP attorney. Um, both of you, maybe just a, a, a couple of words from you both, Gitanjali first, just to introduce yourself to today's listeners. Yeah, sure. Thank you so much, James, for that introduction and for having me here firstly. Uh, my name is Gitanjali, as James already mentioned. I'm an IP lawyer. I'm qualified to practice law in India, and I have been working for the last year in Munich. I've been based in uh, Munich, where I've been doing IPR policy work. But previously, I was involved in uh, intellectual property litigation. So my experience kind of revolves around a bit of litigation, a bit of policy, and specifically in the last six months, I have focused on standard essential patents, and that's my background. Great. Thank you very much, Kiranjali. Uh, Wei Yang? Hi, everyone. So I'm also very glad. Uh, uh, I'm calling in from Singapore, so it's around 4 p.m. today. I'm very glad that uh, you have a you are attending this session and I myself am a patent attorney. My experience uh, in helping, um, my experience is in helping inventors protect their inventions, mostly through patenting. Um, I'm also helping some of my clients uh, with uh, other aspects of IP protection, such as trademarks and designs. I regularly help uh, individual inventors all the way up to MNCs. So I have all sorts of interesting questions that are posed to me on a daily basis. And it keeps my day very exciting and interesting. And I guess that's one of the reasons why I'm doing IP work. So I, I'm glad to be part of this uh, panel discussion today. 
and we hope to talk to, uh, more about Eden today to everyone. Super. Thank you very much both. Um, let's start diving straight into this then. I think you, you brought up some of the key principles of, of intellectual property patents. I know that these words aren't always grasped by everyone, especially new companies who are exploring, you know, growing into the Southeast Asia region. Um, can we just touch upon some of these principles of exclusivity, uh, trademarks, um, also territoriality is very important. Um, Gitanjali, maybe if I can just start with you, what do you think are the most important principles to keep in mind for companies that are looking to expand? Thanks, James. Yes, I think definitely, as you mentioned just now, for if I were advising a company which is, let's say, entering a new market, the most important principle is to keep in mind is territoriality for sure, uh, which basically means that uh, IP rights, any intellectual property right is usually territorial in nature. So it only extends to a nationality. So if you register your intellectual property in, let's say, in Vietnam, then it's protected in Vietnam and it does not extend the borders. So basically, if you're entering a different jurisdiction in another country, then at that point, you need to consider if there is something similar there, something overlapping there, how do you register your property rights there? Because every country has sort of different rules and procedures. While we do have the World Intellectual Property Organization, which has given us sort of these national uh, rules and principles, which is mostly followed across the globe, but procedures across the globe vary. So the threshold for registering a patent is always slightly different in every country. It's not necessarily the same. It's also the consideration specifically while dealing with patents, you have to consider this topic of prior art, which is basically, is this invention already existing in this country is this exa already existing and for how long and if it is then can you really claim exclusive rights over such an invention so i think territoriality priority these are aspects which you need to definitely consider as a first and foremost thing when entering a new jurisdiction and the best way to do that is to go to a local lawyer of that jurisdiction because i think there is no one better to advise you on every jurisdiction's little nuances better than a local lawyer. Yeah, thank you very much, Gitanjali. I, I think that that brings me to another question, which is so there's this idea that there are a lot of international standards, that there are a lot of international agreements and norms that are already adopted by a lot of the Southeast Asian countries. But yet you're saying that we should still focus on individual countries as well, that it is important to go in to those specific countries. Let's say you want to go in Myanmar and, and into Malaysia, uh, having these international agreements isn't enough. You need to go deeper and meet with experts, lawyers in that region. Is that, is that what you're suggesting? Yes, for sure. Because uh, let's, let's talk about one international uh, treaty. For example, we have the Patent Cooperation Treaty, which is the PCT. So there are many member countries of the PCT and a lot of Southeast Asian countries are also members here. So now what happens here is that this has an international process. The PCT lays down an international process for registering a patent. And what you can do is you register your patent under the PCT process and then designate a member country, every member country that you want to also have protection in, but that member country needs to be part of PCT. Now here is where uh, certain differences come in is basically about is every country really a member of PCT? Because in Southeast Asia, there are countries which are not. For example, I believe uh, Wei Yang would be a better place to talk about this, but Myanmar, I believe, is still not member to PCT. So you still have to consider these little nuances and how it would be protected. Of course, you can file in this way to, with mm -hmm. the other countries. But even after filing, there's more to patent protection, right? There's managing your patent. So what is the threshold of keeping your patent alive in a certain country? And what is the threshold for enforcing your patent? What, what exactly is the process for litigation or dispute resolution, let's say arbitration or mediation that is there in every specific country? And this could differ. So this is where you really do need to consult with local councils and keep in mind how you would go about maintaining your patents in every country that you plan to be a part of. 
Okay, thank you very much, Kiranjali. Wei Yang, to, to follow up on that, so these are the kind of services that the SME Help Desk, of course, assists with. Um, can you give me some, some idea of exactly what advice you would be giving to a company that would be looking to, uh, to install itself in, say, Myanmar, for example, as it's, it's just been brought up? Yeah, I, I also wanted to maybe um, contribute more to what Kitanjali was saying. Please, yeah. So um, um, generally, if we are dealing with uh, SMEs or individual inventors or creators, I think the, the basic fundamentals is they, they are usually not very uh, familiar with the different types of IP rights. So, so uh, we are actually their first uh, hand information. We provide first hand information to help identify what is the type of IP rights that should be used to protect that, their invention or creation. So, um, for example, uh, I had a meeting with some of my counterparts recently, and we, we were uh, joking between ourselves. We said that if uh, we get a dollar every time someone says that they want to patent their copyright, we'll be rich because um, a lot of times the, the terms are being used interchangeably and uh, the, the, the clients that we speak to are not very sure exactly what sort of assistance or what sort of rights they want to achieve. And, and besides that, uh, what Gitanjali was saying is also uh, it's um, laws are changing all the time across the world. IP laws are con constantly being updated. The IP laws for Myanmar, for Vietnam, for Singapore has been changing quite a lot over the last couple of years. So if, if even us for ourselves, we take a lot of time and effort to keep ourselves updated with the latest developments in law. Um, I don't think someone who is not um, actively doing IP work is able to understand the nuances, the differences, the variations when they they wish to seek protection across different jurisdictions. So yeah. I think it's best really to leave this to the professionals such as us who work uh, on IP day in and day out to give you proper advice. First of all, on the types of IP that mm -hmm. your company, your business has registered, and then the type of IP rights you need to uh, uh, you need to uh, register. And then uh, again, on the different types of uh, strategies that you need to embark on uh, to protect them in across different territories. So um, back to your question, uh, when uh, I do, of course, get um, maybe uh, to backtrack a little. Yes, I've been working with the help desk for over eight years, I think, by now. So yeah, I have been receiving questions from uh, different companies that wish to enter the Southeast Asian market. And the, the questions are usually patent related because I'm the patent expert uh, to the help desk. So some of the questions that I recall are, are mainly deadline related. Um, and it, it is a very common thing. So uh, patents- Sorry, could you just elaborate on that? Patents, uh, what do you mean there, Wei Yang? Did you yeah. say dateline? Uh, deadlines, yeah. So I for, deadline, for patents, right. uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, deadlines are, are very important because you need to achieve or you need to um, you need to comply with certain things by certain deadlines. And if you don't, uh, you, you might lose the right to um, obtain patents in a particular country. And uh, what I've noticed is that um, usually these uh, these businesses from um, Europe they have already sought assistance with protection in, in Europe itself, but they have not spent enough time thinking about how they, uh, how they can protect it if they are expanding overseas. Sometimes they are only uh, expanding their businesses um, four years, five years down the road after they have uh, spent their efforts to, to, um, to establish their business in Southeast Asia, uh, in, in Europe. So by the time they, they come to Southeast Asia, uh, and they, then they start thinking about patenting, um, uh, more likely than not the deadlines to, to file patents might be uh, already uh, too late, uh, might have lapsed, because mm -hmm. if they had already patented it in Europe, uh, the deadline to patent it in Southeast Asia is, is no more than uh, two or three years 
two and a half years from the day they found it in Europe. Right. So, so um, sometimes it's a shame, but uh, it happens. So uh, this is this is uh, one of the uh, instances or the examples that I can give. Yeah, thank you very much. I think that a, a, a big piece of advice I'm getting out of both of your you know first uh, stories that you're you're sharing is that seek that expert advice. You know that it's don't go in blind into a region thinking you know because you know how it works in Europe. You know by deduction you know how it's going to work it in these other countries. Seek out the advice. Check with the lawyers. Check with the experts. Focus on these deadlines. Um, I, I was reading one case study of a of a European pharmaceutical who had. Uh, who will go unnamed, but who had a uh, painkiller. Uh, and in Vietnam, they noticed quite quickly that uh, a similar looking painkiller had appeared on the Vietnamese market with similar colors and branding. Uh, and when they went to contest this uh, with the Vietnamese authorities, they learned that the um, local drug company had registered a trademark of this new drug uh, and so therefore it made it more difficult because they hadn't protected themselves is that a, a kind of example you've heard of i'll go back to you Jitanjali. is that the kind of example you've heard of 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 um you know companies being too slow to prepare um for these kind of things yes i i mean i do think um speed and also confusion in what you must protect is something that i've noticed companies uh dealing with for example um i saw that there was this one case which i was briefly involved in where there was a patent which was protected in one country but the kind of patent that was protected was a product patent so there are two types of patents one is a product patent which is over a specific um like let's say a a a a specific product, something which is specifically made, something physical and something mm -hmm. tangible, let's say. And then there's something called a process patent, which is kind of how, what was the process that you used to make this technology? So I, the steps that would have steps, like first you need to do this, then then you need to put this in this, and, the, and that process is also protectable under patented rights. And what often happens is that, like, for example, this, I, I got reminded of this with your example, James, because you discussed a pharma company mm -hmm. and pharma companies often do this, that they uh, register one or the other, which is, uh, I mean, in my, in my view, not advisable, but of course, preferably I would, I would, I would say that it's always better to register the product patent because then what happened in this case was that the process patent was registered in the country, but there was no registration for the product patent. And what these um, counterfeit product manufacturers, the copycats, what they do is they'll use the process in another country and then they'll import the final product. So then the country where the final product is, you do not have a product patent there and the process was done elsewhere. So you cannot enforce the process patent there. And very interesting. Then it, it, it's actually very confusing. So I, I, I would say that, of course, the preferable form if a company must go for just one is always a product patent. But uh, the best case is always, I believe, both protecting everything that you want to use. So I, I think a company must be mindful about what really you're looking, what are your future markets and not just your present markets and going into those markets at the right time. Because like Wei Yang also mentioned that if you do not do it at the right time, you could lose the deadline. And then you do not have that chance any longer because patent protection is limited. As we know, it's 20 years. So because it's so limited, you cannot, there is a deadline till when you can register it because basically the whole point is that there's public interest involved in inventions, right? Public needs to be able to use these inventions as well. But on the other hand, we also have to protect the rights of the inventors. So this is a balancing game and both parties have to be vigilant and prompt in enforcing their individual rights, basically. Very good, thank you very much. I think, but both of you, I think that this is all very valuable advice and, and I hope that it's being well heard by, by today's listeners. Um, just, to, just to take a little step back a little bit for a second and just to focus on why 
um, intellectual property patents are so important. Now, of course, this protects innovation. It protects investment into research and development. It, you know, helps growth. Uh, these are all, you know, very critical, important things for any country around the world today. Um, but also, I think that there are some other reasons why this is very important. It's not just the financial health of a company that is dependent on on uh, intellectual property. Um, I, I think about public health, Wei Yang, and, and, and maybe you could you know, elaborate a little bit more on why intellectual property is very important for public health. Oh, yes, um, of course. Um, um, maybe, yeah, to, to reinforce the, the, the whole idea of patents. Um, patents is a right that is give, given in exchange for disclosure of uh, new technology. So, so, and then you get this 20 year um, duration period of uh, this right. And, and after that, it's, it's actually uh, free uh, for public use. So for, for pharmaceutical products, for healthcare products, um, uh, there's a lot of reports saying that it costs over a billion dollars to do R&D, to do clinical trials, and uh, maybe out of 10 drugs that you're testing, only one uh, passes through phase three of the clinical trials. So, so a lot of investments are being uh, put into developing new drugs. And uh, of course, you know, uh, COVID that happened three years ago, two years ago, you wanted to uh, have uh, new drugs uh, coming out or new vaccines coming out, new treatments coming out very rapidly. Uh, that, that requires a lot of uh, investments. And uh, patents, of course, uh, is a way to uh, recoup all that investments that uh, has been uh, uh, that has been poured in into developing products, which you might not even know whether there will be a uh, commercial use for it, especially if the drug doesn't pass the test. So, so um, coming to that, then there's also very interesting, you know, uh, country policies where they will say that um, I have, to, yeah, this this is slightly um, controversial. Some countries would would do not view patents uh, very positively. They they try to frame they frame it in a way that they say that it is Western uh, countries um, enforcing. Yeah, monopolies in, into developing countries, um, and and they like to use healthcare as uh, one of this uh, example, which is true because a lot of this R and D is done in developing uh, in more developed economies. So so um, but it's it's good to know that uh, countries can set aside uh, compulsory licenses, uh, certain exceptions to allow um, uh, generics. To, to be uh, put in place rather than just having the mon monopoly granted to the patent owner. So yeah, I understand it's, it's, it's about striking a balance, isn't it, between this public good and this private interest and trying to find that right balance whereby this important technology that's taken a lot of investment, the company spent a lot of time, a lot of efforts to develop. But if there is this public good to, to come to some sort of agreement in terms of being able to share that knowledge uh, more widely, if necessary, is that is that the the fine yeah. the fine balance we're looking yeah. for? Yeah, there's, there's a fine balance to be made, and every every country has a different way of framing this to to their their population. And I I did remember that there was a big push to to um um I think if I'm not wrong to to make all the patents related to the vaccines. Um, um, free for use during the pandemic period. So, so it, yeah, actually, so you can see, actually, pat patents was really at the forefront uh, mm -hmm. uh, during the COVID period um, because yes. of all these R&D. Um, yes, it's very interesting. It's kind of forgotten that, isn't it? But this, there was this key part that was, you know, part of the funding, the public funding, the, the, the private pharmaceutical investments to try to find the solutions. Yeah. Over to you, Gitanjali. Just uh, I'd like to focus a little bit more. We're, we're about halfway through today's Thing, but I, I wanted to look a little bit at you've worked in, in Munich uh, a, a, and you're you know you're based in, in Mumbai but you, you've worked also more widely with the Asian region Southeast Asian region um the big differences between Europe and Southeast Asia and we're going to have European companies listening to this show 
we've talked about some of the, the, the specifics in terms of deadlines and, and being able to be informed, but is there anything else that you think that they should be keeping in mind should they be exploring whether to invest into, into growth in those regions? Mm -hmm. Thank you for that question, James. Um, I think, yes, we've already sort of touched upon briefly the whole aspect of that. Most of the Southeast Asian countries that we're dealing with right now are developing nations. And um, Europe is a, a highly developing economy. So that is where the key difference in the perspective of how patent protection exists in these two or these multiple jurisdictions differs. Basically, in, in a developed economy, people value patent rights. I have noticed, I, I seem to notice way more. And in uh, developing countries, some it, it really varies. It, it, it's really, it depends from country to country. Some have a, a balanced opinion. Some have a not so, like we discussed with the pandemic waiver and all these things. So we've seen that there have been situations like this. But um, to basically, I think that is the primary difference that people need to consider that while protecting your patents in these countries, you might face a bit more difficulty in getting your patent protected, unless, of course, you deal with the local council and go through the right steps and do it at the right time. You know, we have a list of the right things to do and be the model patent inventor, right? But uh, I think one key difference which I noticed was that uh, in uh, in Southeast Asian countries and in, in a lot of Asian countries, not just Southeast Asian countries, there's a model of petty patents, for example, which is um, utility patents or petty patents. They're called simple patents also sometimes, right. which is basically the same as a patent, but it has a slightly lesser threshold of protection as a normal patent would. And it also has a lesser time duration for uh, its term of protection. So it differs from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Some protected for seven years, some, but none more than I think 10. What's the interest in, in going for the, one of those mini patents rather than the, the full blown patent? What, why would you pick the mini version? You, I mean, if you're able to get a proper patent protection, you wouldn't pick the mini patent, right? Because mm -hmm. you would want longer protection, 20 years worth of licensing fees and basically getting your realizing your R&D and your work for the for a longer duration. But there are certain patents which are actually not eligible for patent protection, the proper patent protection. So the steps that we deal with while protecting the patent are mostly these three steps. The first is novelty, which means that it must be a new invention, completely mm -hmm. new. It must not be something which has previously, which previously exists, which is what we Briefly, I mentioned earlier about prior art. So there should not be something, some prior art, which coincides with what you are inventing. The second is non-obviousness. So non-obviousness is basically that it could be something which has been done before, but it needs to have a, a substantial upgrade to it. It cannot be that you did, a, you know, like, let's say a minor upgrade. And now you're saying that, um, okay, instead of using this material, now we use this material and this and I want a patent for this version. That does not work. So you, you need a substantial upgrade. So that, that, that basically the inventive step, the step which you are inventing should be not obvious, not something which is natural or obvious. And the third one that it should be industrially applicable and practically be, basically be usable, right? It cannot be something that is in your mind and you cannot really mm. apply some some absurd invention that you come up with on a piece of paper uh, exactly yes. i yes. in fact i remember reading in one of my master's classes about an invention with an invisibility gun or something and obviously <laughs> it was rejected so we mm. have we have things like that happen but uh, that's not allowed so these yes. are the two steps and with the utility patent that i mentioned the step of non obviousness is loose here so that's how you get a utility patent. Basically, it can be something a bit obvious, but you'll get maybe seven to 10 years of protection. And now this again, how obvious, how not obvious, it depends from country to country. So every country again has laid down its own rules. So here, this is where you need to again, consult with a local council. If you're having to get a patent over something which is already existing, but you want a minor upgrade to that, then you consult with which country you want to go to and what exactly this little quirk is and 
where it will fall in this level of non-obviousness. So that is, I think, an interesting aspect of uh, Southeast Asian countries of having this new model, sort of. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Gitanjali. Uh, Wei Yang, back to you. I, I wonder, Gitanjali hinted at this. Okay, so we've understood that there's these broader differences between the, the, the European and Southeast Asian. Uh, within Southeast Asia, are you able to, to add some detail for, for some of our listeners about which countries are particularly easy or which countries are particularly difficult in this area? Uh, okay, I, I guess... Um... Uh, first of all, the um, patenting activity uh, is quite varied across uh, Southeast Asia. So certain patent offices are quite uh, established and certain patent offices are still in the process of building its team, uh, of getting a, a team of uh, patent examiners to look at all the different technologies that are being found. So. So in terms of uh, maybe difficulty, um, I, I might want to point out that certain um, IP offices uh, might take a longer time to examine your patent applications uh, because of uh, limited uh, technical expertise on your part. So um, what from uh, I've done a study about the uh, time frame for patent examinations across mm -hmm. Southeast Asia. Um, so far, Thailand seems to be uh, uh, taking the longest time. It can take up to seven years for you to get a patent granted. That's quite um, a long time. I'm, I'm quite taken aback by that figure. Seven years is a long time. If you're trying to plan for investments and uh, yeah. and things like this, it's a long time to have things hanging in the air. Especially um, if you have a 20 year term protection. So, seven years is gone by, you know, even before you actually have a patent. So, yes. for other countries, this is faster. So, these, these are some of the considerations that we'll discuss with our applicants if they, they want to you know, protect in the, uh, the variety of different countries. But um, I also wanted to sort of elaborate on this utility models, patents that Gitanjali mentioned. So, the thing yeah. is, in Southeast Asia, there, there, there's a lot of manufacturing, a lot of agriculture, quite more basic type of uh, economies. And uh, there is still a lot of inventions that can be protected through uh, utility models uh, because they are just minor variations. So actually utility models, patent patterns are for minor variations. When there's a variation, it means that it is novel. It's not the same as what you have uh, before as equipment. So it satisfies the requirement for novelty, but it might not be so inventive. It's not so out of the world sort of uh, difference between uh, what has been uh, known before. So uh, what I understand is uh, Thailand, for example, uh, there are many uh, no, applicants are uh, uh, founding patent patents, utility models, because of the type of industries that uh, are, uh, are co uh, contributing to the economy over there. I also remember that uh, I have found certain uh, patents in Vietnam before that is relating to bicycle parts. So there's a lot of manufacturing happening in Vietnam for bicycle parts. Uh, I, I think Shimano, might be manufacturing there. Actually, the, the brand I was working for is Campat Nolo. So it's a very good bicycle brand. So they were doing their manufacturing in Vietnam. And it was, it was quite simple, basic uh, inventions. And uh, sometimes uh, uh, if you find that you're filing a patent application and then you get rejected because the patent examiner says that there is no inventive step uh, in your invention, so one of the three criteria relating to patentability. Um, the good thing about that is that in Southeast Asia, you can then convert it to a utility model. So from, from uh, instead of trying to get this strong level of protection that lasts 20 years, uh, it, you realize that you don't meet the criteria, you can opt to, to switch your application to a utility model and then it lets you have a higher chance of getting protection, and, but of course at a lower uh, term of protection, which is about seven to 10 years. So, so it's, a, it's, yeah. it's a very um, 
yeah, uh, there's lots of things to think about when uh, uh, dealing with protection in Southeast Asia. And um, we can have some leeway in terms of uh, deciding which are the territories that you want to file in, depending on the time frame, uh, whether you want to file patterns immediately or you want to file utility models immediately. So the, yeah, it, I guess talk to an advisor if you, if you want to be <laughs> with pattern protection invention in, in Southeast Asia. Yeah, so I was, I was just going to make that point myself, Wei Ying. Um, we, yeah. we, we need to move on, but we could talk for, for a long time because I'm sure companies would have many, many questions in, in different areas here. But just to say that, yeah, you know, there are these services that are set up, such as the SME Help Desk, um, and that, you know, we do recommend that everyone go into there, look at the fact sheets uh, and contact the experts uh, because this is a bit of a minefield and there are some dangers here. So uh, to seek that advice. Um, just to just to move on to um, uh, World Intellectual Property Day, so it's the 26th of April this year, and I just wanted the, the, the theme of this year is women and intellectual property, uh, and because you know we have two women here today, I just wanted to explore this topic uh, a little bit, um, and just to ask maybe Yuki Danjali, what is it that drew you to this kind of work, intellectual property, and, and the law around this this sector? Mm -hmm. Well. Yes, I think, uh, firstly, I think it's a great topic this year for, for World IP Day. And one of the reasons that I actually joined the IP field was because uh, I ha I knew someone and I knew a few people who were my mentors, who were my professors in back in my bachelor's, so when I did my university in law school, who were IP, IP teachers or IP professors or IP lawyers, and they were women and men both. But uh, with the women, particularly, I was always, uh, you know, you identify yourself with who you are. And I think for me, I identified myself with them. And that is exactly why I got into this profession. It wasn't till I actually got in that I actually realized that uh, there aren't a lot of women here. So that was a surprise for me, which came later. And I, and I think we need, I, I think that it's great that we have this topic and we're talking about it and we're having more um, uh, uh, sort of uh, now we have organizations for women and IP and things like that. And I think these are things which are really a step in the right direction and really why students such as me earlier had chosen to be in this field. So I think you really need to see someone you identify as you and get in that field. And that's what happened to me. So yeah, that's why. Yeah. Very good. That's very, that's great to hear. Uh, so we're moving in the right direction. The the World Intellectual Property Organization, where Yang said that there's still not enough women, uh, that there's still too many challenges, barriers to entry. Um, what do you think? How do you think we can resolve this? How do you think we can start to to break down those barriers a bit further? I I I don't know. I I guess this is such a deep uh, topic to talk about. <laughs> But I can, I can give you my personal experience. I have a technical background and uh, being someone with a technical background, I think we're kind of more aware of uh, patents because uh, patents basically protect technology. So maybe I, I, I identify with I, Albert Einstein. He's the most famous uh, personality that is associated with patents. Um, I, this is actually a second career for me. So I was at a point in time thinking of what I could do uh, based on my background, which is tech-based. And uh, I thought there was a, it's a nice interface of being to, uh, to be still very close to technology and then to deal with the legal aspect of it, uh, being a patent attorney. So, so I, I did some research and I, I um, yeah, make, make the efforts to become a patent attorney. It's been very rewarding. Um, I do, of course, know that there are more males than females in these industries. And sometimes during like industry uh, conferences, I'm surrounded by men in suits and I do feel a little terrified, <laughs> like underrepresented in, in that sense. Uh, but it's also a good thing, you know, if you're a lady and you wear a red dress, you stand up immediately. So there's pros and cons uh, being a, a minority in, in this industry. Uh, I think uh, the good thing about uh, being in the patents industry is that everyone is very um, 
passionate about what they do. Uh, they, they particularly chose to be in this industry. They like technology. They like discussing about things. They are always working with innovative people. So, so I, if, if you know you are a lady or even uh, whichever gender you are, you find that this is an industry that appeals to you, you go for it. It's, it's very rewarding. And uh, like what I said, like by, by the start, um, every day is a very exciting day for me because I, I work with uh, clients with uh, all sorts of interesting questions. And I will work with them over the years to, to help improve their, their uh, situation in terms of IP protection. That's great. That's very encouraging, Wei Ying, and thank you both for the for those comments. I think that you are, you know, showing not only how interesting it is, but also, you know, that the the work can be really rewarding uh, and encouraging people to to follow the path that you've taken. So, so thank you for that. Um, we have just five minutes left. Um, we've had some questions um, from the audience. We just a, a couple of these. I wanted to to, to bounce off you um, before we we finish up for today. Um, Gitanjali, um, one question that came in here is. Are there any alternative methods of protecting innovations and keeping them undisclosed to the public? Uh, by that, you know, does trade secret protection exist in Southeast Asian countries? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so that's that's a good question. I feel uh, because we're dealing with in inventions today, and the other alternative to protecting an invention is keeping it a trade secret. Trade secret is usually typically a common law protection. So common law basically does not need a statute as such. But uh, in Southeast Asia, I noticed that many countries actually do have statutory trade secret protection. So it's um, it does exist by either statutory law or by common law, which is uh, the practice of the courts and what is generally followed. But yes, it does exist and it applies to basically uh, inventions, which let's say are um, not inventions, but sensitive and confidential information, let's mm -hmm. say. So any processes, a recipe, for example, the most famous trade secret that we all know is the recipe of Coca-Cola, right? So that's a trade secret. So these are things that you can keep secret. The benefit as opposed to patents is that you do not have to disclose it. So if it's a kind of uh, invention or a, uh, an information which you do not wish to be disclosed, which is not really earning you money from being disclosed, but more to your company personally, and is giving you a competitive advantage, either towards your competitors or through your customers, then you can keep it confidential. But of course, there are steps for protecting it. So usually the steps are basically keeping it um, keeping it confidential, ensuring that you have the right checks in place. So IT security, uh, making sure that you have, you sign agreements with your employees, ex-employees. So all of this is really important with trade secret protection. And yes, it does exist in Southeast Asia in different forms. Right, thank you. Thank you very much. Wei Ying, a, a final question for you before we, we finish today. Um, is it possible to speed up uh, the, the grant of, uh, of patent applications in, in the region? Um, yes, uh, it is. Uh, so that's a very good question too, because I guess it ties in with what I've said earlier in Thailand, it might take up to seven years. So then other countries is about four years. So the, the examination process um, is duplicated in patent offices. When you're filing a patent in, let's say 10 patent offer, uh, filing the request for a patent to 10 patent offices, uh, what happens is 10 patent offices will conduct their own uh, individual independent examination. But uh, we, we find that um, it, you know, it, it seems like that's quite a bit of a waste of effort, right? So if one patent office has done its homework, would it, wouldn't it be nice if it could be shared with the other patent offices? So there are now some agreements between various patent offices that they can share the reports that is uh, generated by the first one with the second one. So that's a way to uh, accelerate the, the patent examination process of your, your patent application in the second office. So uh, there is a agreement between Southeast Asia uh, countries. So nine Southeast Asian countries have an agreement where they will share their patent uh, examination results with each other. This is to speed up the, 
the uh, grant process. There's also uh, international uh, wide uh, agreements. Uh, it is called the patent uh, prosecution highway. So for example, Singapore and China has an agreement. So uh, they can share their reports with each other. And this is also another way to accelerate your examination. Then apart from that, there's also um, certain patent offices will allow you to accelerate the grant if you give them um, strong reasons that uh, the grant uh, has to be issued soon. So for example, there is a flagrant infringement in the marketplace. Uh, for example, there's a competitor coming up with a competing uh, uh, product or for example, maybe a pandemic or whatever, whatever. So if you have very compelling reasons, you can actually request uh, certain patent offices to accelerate the grant of the patent. So Singapore allows that free of charge. Uh, Malaysia, you need to pay some extra fees. So, so okay. that's the reason to do that. That's great. Thank you very much, Wei Ying. Thank you very much, Gitanjali, for, the, for those two uh, final answers. Um, I'm just going to go through a little bit of housekeeping, but I just wanted for, to first thank you both very much for joining us today. Um, I hope our, our listeners and our viewers have got a lot of information, and, and I think you've provided them some great uh, indications of where they can go and find that, uh, that, that information. Uh, so thank you both very much uh, for, for joining us today. Most welcome. Thank you. Thank you, James. Most welcome. Uh, just before I, since you mentioned about where to find the information before I drop off, I wanted to mention that uh, for the viewers to visit the website for ipcouncil.eu because there's a lot of material there for uh, any uh, IP and innovation related topics. We do share infographics, webinars, uh, presentations, articles, and a lot on this subject. In fact, there is also a dedicated section called for SMEs. So specifically for the audience here, I think that would be worth a look. And uh, that's it from my end. Thank you so much. Fantastic. You, you preempted me, uh, Gitanjali. I was going to uh, I was going to mention to jump onto the the four IP and, and to thank them for 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 helping us and partnering with us today to to put on this um, this vodcast. Um, just to say to to our viewers that if you missed any of this, as I said, we're going to be posting this on the YouTube channel. Um, if you want more information, not only is there the four IP Council website, but there's also the S Southeast Asia IP Help Desk website, which I mentioned earlier. That's www.sea dash iphelpdesk.eu uh, and you can submit questions through that website so do go a, a away and do that um finally we'd love to know what you thought about today's vodcast so uh, in the closing titles there'll be a qr code that will appear uh, and we'd be grateful if you could just take a minute to share your views on today's edition um and that's it uh thanks again to our guests thank you very much uh for joining us and uh, we will be back in a couple of months time Thank you very much, everyone. Bye-bye.